I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sammy Sino, Amanda Silva, and Raj Shah Martinez. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the November 2016 edition of the PRS Journal Club. My name is Raj Shah Martinez, and I'm joined by my fellow resident ambassadors, Amanda Silva and Sammy Sino. This month, we are joined by Dr. Bill Adams. He's a proud Princeton undergrad graduate and Vanderbilt Medical School alum and UT Southwestern Plastic Surgery graduate. He's an associate clinical professor at UT Southwestern Medical Center and associate editor of PRS. In addition to his many publications and books he's authored, he's also the founder and president of the Plastic Surgery Channel, a multimedia information source for plastic surgery and a renowned educator. Thank you so much, Dr. Adams, for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Absolutely, Raj. In this discussion, we'll be focusing in on a study by Dr. Ziao et al. with senior author Dr. Bill McGee from Operation Smile on the barriers to reconstructive surgery in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, it's a cross-sectional study of 453 cleft lip and cleft palate patients in Vietnam. The authors identified 884 eligible households in various cities that they visited and randomly surveyed 51% of them. This yielded survey data from 453 households, like they mentioned in their title, throughout five cities in Vietnam. The author's eligibility criteria included any individual who is residing in Vietnam in those cities with a cleft lip, plus or minus cleft palate, and that was either repaired or unrepaired. They used WHO-validated surveys, which were adapted to either surgical state. In their study population, cost, mistrust of providers, lack of supplies, and lack of trained physicians were noted to be the most significant barriers for obtaining surgery from local hospitals. Counterintuitively, they noted that 85% of the patients who did not have surgery actually reported having insurance. They also noted that 63% of the households who did have surgery had some insurance as well, meaning that more of them did not have insurance. Also, there weren't any differences in the household income or hospital access between those who did and did not have cleft surgery. Although there were surgical facilities that were more accessible than mission sites, the respondents stated that they could not attain the care at those facilities due to the cost of the care and some of the other factors we'll discuss. Of those who did have prior cleft surgery, 83% of them ended up having it from charity care. If not for the charity care that they did receive, 43 of the respondents noted that they did not have access to surgical cleft care. Adding to these worrisome numbers, 41% of the study population did not have access to non-surgical cleft care which included pediatric care, dental care, and importantly, speech therapy care. The structural, financial, and cultural barriers to care were really presented well in Figure 1, uh, and these included a reported lack of personnel, lack of equipment or medicine, financial barriers, lack of savings on behalf of the respondents, travel costs, and then food and living expenses associated with traveling for the actual care. To me, this study highlights the fact that in Vietnam, the majority of the patients surveyed relied on charitable care despite being covered under a centralized healthcare system, which leads to delay of care. The authors note that the average cleft care of the respondents was 3.24 years for their first cleft surgery at all. This is compared to recommended guidelines with repairs of 3 to 18 months of age. I think this study is overall limited by the fact that it's based in one country. I mean, it does have a captive population that they're operating on, so there may be some selection bias there for those being surveyed relative to the people who are actually giving them free care. Despite these limitations, though, I think the data provides important information regarding the specific barriers to surgical care that really hasn't been previously addressed, and they resulted in a very sophisticated model here that builds on prior work that addressed specific barriers to surgical care they address single versus multiple intervention diseases and specific challenges that are faced by low- and middle-income countries. I think it's a very elegant study, and it's certainly open up to discussion from our group. And any thoughts, Dr. Adams, on this? Do you think this is truly translatable to across the world, um, or do you think it's a little bit more unique to Vietnam? Well, I think we've all seen, you know, the value of the different charitable organizations, and there's many of them out there that go to underprivileged areas and do work. I think it's always been very important for the different countries and areas that these various organizations provide care. I'm not surprised one finding the study. That's that's what they found. You know, the question is, in the big picture, whether these organizations can help train the actual physicians in the area to start providing proper care over time. And do you think that, is there anything from the study that you all think that can help any of these organizations maybe 
to see some of these numbers improve in terms of probably the biggest thing in this study is the delay in care you mentioned that people are getting, which is probably usually pretty significant for a cleft patient in terms of their long-term outcomes. And is there anything that you guys take away from that or that can maybe help the organizations figure out how to get people trained over time? Yeah, you know, it's a great point. And I think to me, it, it, it seems like there's two major points here that may be influencing that, right? So one, I think it could be training. It could be the fact that the surgeons and the plastic surgeons are in those areas, maybe overwhelmed by the burden of the disease. And, you know, people often cite the fact that in lots of sort of the low income and middle income countries that there are staff there, but they can't just physically meet all the needs that everyone who's there. Um, I think people are generally speaking, I would assume, fairly well trained abroad and do know the indications, but the people who end up getting charity care are those who were not able to access that. But certainly if there's an educational component to it, then that is one easy area where I think these cultural exchanges from these missions would certainly be able to help. The other is I wonder sort of, you know, are these communities, talk a little bit about the medium income for these families, but it wasn't in comparison to, let's say, a group of people there who did get that cleft taken care of locally. So I wonder if there's a disparity there socioeconomically, even within the one country. And then the other point that at least is in my head, I don't know what you, you guys uh, think, is I wonder if there's a perception from the local community that these international groups may be better trained or better able and hence reticent to go to their local areas and rely rather on these trips that come in. Um, they mentioned here in their paper that, you know, Operation Smile funds for the families, covers their traveling expenses, does put them out, give them some lodging, and that in and of itself may be enough. And I wonder if the government or charities took care of that to have local care, would that be enough to get them to have the local care? Because they technically are covered. They're just not using, it seems like, their home resources. Well, I think to answer from my perspective your question, Dr. Adams, these are such tough and important questions. And looking at from my experience as a resident at NYU, I, I see what goes into having a, a comprehensive cleft team and, uh, and center. And I think about the not only surgeons, but the ear, nose, and throat surgeons that work with us, the dentists, the nasal alveolar molding specialists, the photographers, the speech and language pathologists, the family support networks and teams that we have here. In addition, all the ancillary support. It's just, to me, the idea and concept of training surgeons is just not enough. It's about training to have a system of a comprehensive cleft care team that's in place that goes beyond the surgeons. And I think that's where the financial resources come in. And I, I just don't know the best ways to do that. But there's so much that goes into the care of these patients for a long period of time. I think it's really hard to totally comprehensively answer these kind of questions and get around the financial element right now. Yeah, I would agree with you guys exactly. It's not just about the one surgery. It's about, first off, educating the patients and the families to know that they even have access to this care and then having that, that care be accessible. Like Raj mentioned, operations will fund these families, will pay for their lodging, travel, and food. That's probably a huge benefit and incentive for them to come and get the surgery, and then do they get that same reimbursement when they need the post-op care and they need the follow-up? I don't know. You know, and if somehow the country were able to either make the care more accessible to them distance-wise or somehow facilitate the travel costs for them. Absolutely, man. I think, you know, you're, you hit the nail on the head as well. So my takeaway certainly from this article is really that it seems the authors are to be commended for really looking at this question in depth. They have a ton of patients at 100% of that 51% that they surveyed, all essentially responded. Um, and I think that just speaks to the organization of this group to get such a great number of people and, and really get important data to then now be able to model and add to some of the World Health Organization initiative. Their you know, surgical aid is one of the major, major contributors of public health going forward. And then there's a lot of issues going on towards that. And I think Dr. Uh, McGee's team and Operation Smile and, and their whole team at, at USC here has really done a strong job of detailing what are the specific issues that relate to our plastic surgery patients. You know, a lot of the other things that are out there with surgical aid relate to sort of single surgery. You know, like you were mentioning, Amanda, this is a life, and, and Sam, you know, these are lifelong multidisciplinary issues that don't just stop once the cleft is repaired, but rather you need that speech therapy, dental, ENT, support, et cetera, to really care for these patients long term. So I think, I think your point is very well taken, Dr. Adams. Well, good. I think it was a good discussion.